Hey, hello everybody. This is our new episode from the Audacious Explorer podcast, and we are here today with Steph Lagana. Hey, Steph. Hello. <laughs> Happy to have you here. Um, so we just had a quick talk. Uh, we had a, a quick uh, chat about, well, we started with some <laughs> technical difficulties. And um, Steph, I wanted to to mention something that really caught my attention before starting any, any other uh, type of discussion. Your slogan is, remember your truth, rekindle your fire, take bold action towards your dreams. So I'm curious about how this phrase is connected with what you now do for a living. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm so excited to be here. I felt this like whoosh of energy getting to connect <laughs> with you. Um, I really feel like a part of my my purpose on this planet is to help people rekindle the fire inside of themselves and deeply connect with their own personal story and how that relates to the awakening of the planet. Because as a part of my personal path, I felt so disconnected from my own internal fire and I felt so lost and isolated from the people around me and from God. When I was growing up, I didn't have a personal relationship with the church. My family wasn't religious. And I had this really exciting series of events that felt in the moment like a complete catastrophe. And it turned out to be this space making series of events in my life that have made the way for miracles to occur. Um, mm. I was a program manager for the U.S. military for a long time, uh, for almost um, 11, 11 and a half years. Wow. Yeah, it's a completely, it's a completely different part of um, my life. And yet it's still me. It still informs who I am today. I am the most practical spiritual teacher and life coach. I, mean, I, don't, I, have, I have no time for anything that doesn't work. <laughs> I want everything to be relevant and easy and simple. Um, but I went to Afghanistan in 20, mm. 2012 and I was there for six months. And in some ways it was um, a climax in my life. It was something that I had tried to do. I had applied six or seven times uh, to go and support that particular mission. It was something that I was really passionate about. I knew that I was a very capable, skilled person and so even though it was wildly dangerous and not something that a lot of other people thought would be a good idea if they weren't in the military, um, I, I wanted it. And Asia had its way with me and it was intense. And some of the work days were 20 hours long and I was there seven days a week in the office. And the only day that there was any sort of a break was Christmas. And that included, you know, like maybe three or four hours of watching sci-fi, but still more work. Um, I came back and I felt so disconnected from my loved ones, um, friends and family and from my coworkers. And there was just this like volcano of anger that was inside of me. And it was, it was really rough. Um, and in the moment, um, there was just like this intense suffering. And as a part of my own healing journey, I went through this life coach training program that wound up being this like miraculous activation of so many things inside of me. You had a question. Yeah, so I was wondering absolutely Afghanistan, like I I cannot imagine what it must have been like for you. So you were working on field, right? Yeah, so I was on a military base, which I mean it's I actually I had an old coworker of mine ask if I was staying in a hotel and I was like, what? No. <laughs> there was there was no Marriott. Um, I was on a military base. And it was a really large um, base. It was about 35,000 people. It was in southern Afghanistan in a, a city called Kandahar. And mm. um, I was there for six months. And I had a lot of very intense experiences. The sexual assault rate in that particular area, in a restricted area that I was in with all sorts of military and, and government folks, was really high. It was over 30%. Yeah. So in addition to there being rocket attacks regularly, if not daily, um, there was this ongoing threat of, of sexual assault and it, it was all consuming. I came back and I didn't realize that I had um, post-traumatic stress disorder. I would go into the living room and I would hear a commercial that had a, a particular sound at the beginning 
that was mm. almost exactly the same as the alarm going off on the base saying that there was an incoming rocket. So I came back home and even though I was physically safe, my brain didn't realize it. And so I was like repeating the trauma, you know, going back into the patterns of not feeling like I could trust anybody. And oh, it was so intense. I wish I could go back in time and hug myself, you know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I, I take it that this was your catalyst. This was the moment when you like going back home from Afghanistan. That was the moment when you decided that something's got to change and basically everything boiled uh, into you getting more interested in self-development and coaching per se. Yeah, yeah. And that's the long and the short of it. Looking backwards, it all makes sense. But living it and moving forward mm -hmm. is this like hopscotch back and forth kind of like lily pads on the water. Where am I going next? Um, I, I went back to the U.S. after the six months deployment and um, it was so intense and I was suffering so much and I was drinking alcohol at the time, which was a way of me avoiding that intensity of emotional pain. And um, I just got to a point where I realized I'm not happy. I don't know what to do. And there were these series of books that I had read maybe in the early 2000s, like 2004, 2005. And I found myself on this woman's website. She's a Harvard trained sociologist. She writes a column for Oprah magazine, which I didn't realize at the time, but she had this very magical way of describing her relationship with the world. Mm -hmm. and it was so compelling to me. It was like, like a perfume, you know, that I wanted to experience more. And so I wound up going on this nine month part-time coach training and it, it really healed uh, like a canyon that was inside of me. There were parts that were just like, that were ripped and and it and it healed me it was glorious <laughs> and i've been doing that work ever since i realized that not only was it useful for my healing but it was something that i was deeply passionate about giving to other people yeah so it was through the process of this training that you realized that you also want to be a, of service to other women because i understand that you are working supporting mostly women yeah yeah it was a huge activation moment for me it was like the lights turned on in my life and everything became clear yeah it's very because i kind of had the same the same path and i think that many coaches uh do not do not go into coaching training because they want to become coaches they just go there because they want to like deal with their own issues and then they realize how impactful that is that they want to help other people yeah totally i've i've interacted with a few people I think once you get into a coaching uh, community, you can be so deep inside of it that you might not meet people who have no idea what it is. Mm. That much. And I've met a few people that have thought, well, you uppity life coaches, you think you know all the answers. I'm like, no, 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 not at all. I'm the most broken person that there is. And it means I've made all the mistakes and I just want to share my experiences with you. And that way you don't have to make the same mistakes that I've done. It's super simple. Yeah. yeah. So who are you serving now? What is your like ideal client or just the clients in general <laughs> that you are really passionate about working with? Yeah, it's it's largely women who are very similar to the version of myself from that old world working in uh, the U.S. national security environment. People who are very aggressive and action oriented and super invested in their own success, but are also just super tired. Like, exhausted from working so hard and not having enough time for themselves, putting everyone else first and the needs of everyone and everything around them before they can get to themselves. And at the heart of what I do, I connect people with their non-physical allies. I help people see the conspiracy of support that is going on around them, whether it's getting more intimate with this idea of angels and spirit guides or seeing repeating numbers and synchronicity. It can look a variety of different ways, but it's always fun um, and playful, cool. It's always a really interesting experience. I've had everything from people realizing that their animal totem was a fox and mm -hmm. seeing it in a landscape where foxes don't really show up um, to identifying that they have a song angel and every time they get into the car, the radio is kind of talking with them. Um, there's a lot of different ways that it can look, but it's, it's usually women that are committed to trying something different 
that involves having a really playful, vibrant conversation with the universe. Mm, that's really interesting. And it's very funny that we're having this conversation today because I was just thinking, wow, I wish I I could learn more about how it is that you actually get to become what I would call a spiritual coach, right? Because us life coaches, we are more about asking questions and mirroring. <laughs> um, whereas I absolutely acknowledge you for, for bringing this up and for making it visible. Um, I truly trust that each of us is connected to the source. We call it, some of us call it God, some of us call it Mother Earth, the universe. Um, and you are helping women really, really reinforce this connection and make it work for their for their betterment, right? So that they become more invested in their lives, more present in their lives. So how is it that you got to learn <laughs> how to like decrypt these messages or to get to get in touch with your own Alice? Because I guess it started like that. I want to touch on what you said first before I go into that. Um, this whole idea of making it visible I think is huge. I've got goosebumps all over my body right now, actually. Um, I've interacted with high performance athletes who are also in the military. I've interacted with a lot of really vibrant um, CEOs, all sorts of people who are in like a peak performance kind of position. Mm -hmm. And I really do think that when people talk about their intuition or when they talk about the creative muses, you know, whether it's like Steve Jobs from or Steven Spielberg or Oprah, they're really truly talking about a connection with their divine team and with their soul, with their highest self. So I love that you said that because I think it's a conversation that is continuously happening when the recording goes off, you know, like when the meeting minutes are stopped in the boardroom, when these key decisions are being made. And unless you're at an elite level, you don't realize the sort of decision-making paradigm that people are using. And then when you do, everything makes sense because cultivating this relationship with your non-physical allies um, and with your highest self, with your intuition means that all of your decisions can be so much simpler. The landscape is so much clearer and you can understand what does it look like for you to show up. It can still scare the hell out of you <laughs> to do it because it will, whatever path you're on will probably push all of your buttons as a part of your spiritual journey if your thought is anything like mine. But it's golden because that means that you get like, these huge challenges that translate into massive opportunities for self-awareness and lots of really juicy stuff. Um, but how did I come into it? Oh my gosh. So I felt like the least guided person on the planet. I was in this really deep thinking space. And as a part of the journey that I've been on, I realized what a contentious ally my brain can be. Mm. You know, my heart never fails me, my gut never lies, but man, oh man, my brain gets freaking out of control. <laughs> and for the longest time, I was a very left brain, logical, strict person. And I thought I truly could think myself out of any situation. And it absolutely was not the case. Yeah. My brain was trying the best that it could, but it was being given jobs that were not commensurate with its position description. Like it was way, the jobs it was being given were way too big. And so I, I felt like so frustrated. Mm. With the decisions that I needed to make um, that I, that I knew were coming. I was in a relationship that was pretty toxic and I knew I needed to leave. And I, we were together almost six years and I think I was leaving him for the last two. And it was like this helicopter pattern where I was going in motion, but it was in circles. You know, I wasn't actually moving anywhere. And, yeah. and I, I, I tell you, I just prayed to God like every day, <laughs> all the time. It was this constant, um, prayer. You know, please help me, please let me figure it out. And the more that I was able to get into my body and out of my mind, the easier I was able to start to see, okay, so this feels better than this does. I can move toward mm -hmm. that. Or this person doesn't feel good and I need to get them out of my life. Like I need to ditch this social obligation. I need to make sure that I'm not seeing them. There, there were just small steps, concrete things um, that I could do. And ultimately all the stuff that was really tiny created this huge mosaic that was the path for me to walk. 
Yeah, I would like to touch upon two things. So firstly, you mentioned something about having to go through the pain to kind of transform and get to who you are now. Um, and this is a question that I've been asking myself for a while. Um, and in my expression, in my experience with coaching, we reached the conclusion that it is possible to grow without the pain. It's what we call self assumed like conscious conscious growth but it feels that so many so so few people are taking this path and most of us have to go through the bumpy <laughs> through the bumpy road yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um so how do you how is it did you find a way of helping the women that you are supporting to kind of not do it through pain <laughs> though yeah and like you can't run away from the pain forever pain is just a part of life um but maybe just to make to to get a transformation in a more conscious in a more responsible and self-contained way yeah that's such a great question thank you um i think that we're entering a new paradigm um all the you know strange language that you see on like the deepest most woo-woo spiritual parts of the internet i totally mm -hmm. believe in I truly believe that humanity is awakening and that there are energies that we have access to now that we haven't had before so we can do things easier simpler in a way that's more connected mm -hmm. we're closer to the infinite parts of our being truly um i also think that when you're willing to believe that life is happening for you and not to you that you don't have to have as antagonistic a relationship with pain. It can be a part of the process instead of something that you fight against. Um, my experience with pain is that it's the best graduate school that there is. It grounds you into the present moment, which most people time travel. They spend lots of time in the past regretting their decisions, or they spend lots of time in the future thinking about what could be but that removes you from where your power is, which is in the present moment. And with all of the knowledge that you have in your body with your gut instincts. And there's also a lot of disconnect between conceptual knowing, the knowing that your head has mm. and experiential knowing, truly understanding the power of all sorts of lessons that, you know, it's like the old wives tales, like people can give you, stories and give you anecdotes like the golden rule but when you experience it when you feel it in your body it's like this lightning that strikes in you and you're like oh <laughs> now i see what they were talking about now i've got it and i think that's the power of pain it's this incredibly capable instructor and when we can fail quickly and allow ourselves to lean into the lessons it doesn't have to be protracted, lengthy, a crazy long period of time. It can be simple and we can go, oh, okay, that's it. And lean into where life is guiding us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very beautiful. Thank you for uh, for sharing this. It is for me. It was it was also a lesson that I really took my time <laughs> integrating the fact that there is knowledge here, and I had a lot of knowledge here, but uh, like my soul could not take it in. Right. So I had to like go through the experience over and over again to kind of allow it to sediment <laughs> and become a part of who I am. Yeah. 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 Um, so I know that you you were you just returned from India, a very spiritual place. How long how how long did you did you go to India for? Uh, so I was there just about three months. And it was an amazing experience and really interesting because I'm 35 years old and most of the people that I encountered were in a different phase of their lives. Either they were younger because they had just left school and they were doing some traveling before they started a more formal professional occupation or uh, they had quit a job sometimes in their early 40s. And they were completely rethinking what it was that they were going to do. I met a few location independent entrepreneurs, which was really cool. Um, but it was just interesting to see this spectrum. It was such a completely like mind blowing amount of diversity. So many different people, so many different nationalities, everything, uh, everyone from Slovenia um, to Brazil. It was it was super cool. 
Yeah. Um, so what did you do <laughs> during these three months? Did you just enjoy yourself traveling or uh, you invested in some <laughs> deep <laughs> spiritual practices? Oh my gosh. Yeah. What didn't I do? Um, I did not eat curry three times a day. I encountered a lot of people <laughs> who were really over eating curry three times a day. And I was like, okay, look, twice a day is all right, but it cannot start with breakfast. It's unacceptable. <laughs> oh, so I, I asked. So one of the things that I do is um, I try to have enough unstructured time in my life that I can really respond to like where my energy is at. And that includes asking my non-physical team, my spiritual allies for help. And mm. so when I um, made the decision last year, I had this basically an intuitive knowing, this download from the universe, like, okay, I need to go on this big trip to India. It was from a complete space of trust that I accepted. Okay. I know that I need to go on this big trip, the spiritual walkabout. And as a part of like the sacred unwinding, you know, my identity is shifting, big things are happening. I need to be out in the world and, and walking it. Um, and so I accepted, yes, I'm going to go out there and I don't know what I'm going to do. So I went to buy the tickets in say like October, November timeframe. And so I started having this conversation with my guides. I was like, okay, guys, you know, I, I'm totally comfortable with being in a flow state and being um, open to responding to whatever wants to happen day to day. But it would help if I'm going to be gone for three months to have a sense of what we're going to do. <laughs> so just like, just like the universe now, like seriously, just a little bit of structure would be great. Uh, because one of the things that is a dynamic for me is that I want to know what's going to happen. Mm. And I get bored if I know too much. So it's like this um, uh, dialogue, you know, I want to know enough that I can be comfortable that everything's going to be okay, but not too much that I know the end of the story. Yeah. When I went to buy the airline tickets, I asked, I was like, okay, God, you know, my, my team, my allies, like, what do you want me to do? And I got the sense that I needed to go talk with the land and I needed to go to the desert first and then go to the ocean and then go to the mountains. And basically that's what I did. I spent uh, the first five weeks of my trip in Rajasthan. Uh, so North and then West up towards the Pakistan border and mm. ate a tremendous amount of <laughs> vegetables and <laughs> went on camel rides and just moved around and had this very intense series of experiences. It's a very conservative part of India and there aren't many mm. that are out. So as a Western woman, you are um, the subject of lots of extra attention, some of which can feel super uncomfortable and at times unsafe. Um, mm. You're also just not one of many women that are out and about because most of the Indian women are at home. They're taking care of the family, they're taking care of the house. And so it was this really intense, um, yeah, very intense experience. That's the best way that I can describe it. Um, so that was the first five weeks. I was pretty stressful. I felt very... Um, I can imagine you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was what I wanted. Um, and I was also able to link up with a lot of other people, wonderful travelers, men and women. Um, and I wound up having a few travel buddies moving around that area, which was super cool. Um, but it was very much like in my body feeling kind of small as opposed to this very deeply connected kind of high priestess persona that I feel most of, of the other times in my life. Uh, and then I went to the ocean in the south. I went to Goa, which is this place where mm. a huge amount of tourists. You've heard of it? <laughs> yes. I, I will tell you just after after your your, <laughs> your story. Yeah, so um, a completely different experience. And I love the ocean. I'm a total water baby. So I spent mm -hmm. a month there. And I thought, you know, if the only other thing that I do is go see the Taj Mahal and go home, it's okay. You know, I've been brave. I've done hard things. I don't need to prove any, yeah. anybody else. This is my trip. So I stayed at the beach for a month and I wrote and I went and I tried to see dolphins by kayak and saw mm -hmm bioluminescent plankton and water and it was an incredible experience and I just like soaked in all the sunsets that I could get and it was fantastic and tried not to feed every mosquito <laughs> like an hour radius around me 
<laughs> I don't even want to know what my overall contributions were there. <laughs> yeah, she donated blood <laughs> to the Indian mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, they, I'm sure they were like posting up flyers like, hey, go get this girl. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I spent a month in Goa and then I went north. Um, and I so I took a 31 hour train from Goa to Agra, which if anyone watching this has the interest in going to India and winds up going, please take the train. It is, it's like going to an amusement park. It's the coolest mm. thing. There's families. Um, it feels almost like a pajama party. Meets <laughs> park. It's super cool. Um, and I went to Agra and I saw the Taj Mahal and I thought, okay, if I do nothing else, this has been a good trip. And then I decided to go north to Himachal Pradesh where Dharamsala is with the Dalai Lama. And from there, I started to see uh, the name of this temple that I had looked at before, back in like that, in the fall, when I was looking at things to do in India, trying to feed my brain some information while I, I knew that my guides had everything under control. It's all good. But sometimes the fact that, <laughs> you know, a little bit chew on. I decided to see this temple, which is one of the most sacred pilgrimages that you can do in India. Eight mm. million Indians go every year. And, wow. Yeah. And so it's a temple to the goddess. Mm -hmm. and it is up the side of a mountain. <laughs> and I went. I like the day before uh, I found this woman who was also in Dharamshala and she was an American and she felt the call of the goddess too. She's 53. So both of us are, you know, not crossfitters, not the most athletic people on the planet. Um, but we walked around 18 miles, 25 kilometers. Wow. And the travel agent had told me, oh, it'll take three or four hours. No big deal. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> there's, there's no way. In hell, like if you're an Olympic athlete, maybe, but, <laughs> but other than that, there's no way in hell. Um, and so we left at 11 o'clock. It took eight hours to go up the mountain and it was like this. Okay. It was incredible. Wow. Yeah. And we were the last two people that they let into the temple before mm. we went for the evening prayers. I mean, it, it felt like we were being pulled by the universe inside. Yeah. Um, it was incredible. And I, like, as soon as we got in, I started sobbing from relief and joy. And it was the most sacred thing. It was the most divine, ecstatic experience. And looking back on it, I go, oh, that's why I was there. That's why all that time I was navigating in India, thinking to myself, what in the holy, <laughs> why am I here? This is nuts. That's why. Yes. You have moments when you don't realize what everything is kind of building towards. And I think that for many of us who are not, um, who are maybe at the beginning of the, of the spiritual path, it's difficult to believe that there is something after that moment when everything kind of falls apart and you're experiencing like the most excruciating pain. Um, and then like for me, what was really important was to go back to trust. Um, and it it wasn't easy at all. It wasn't easy at all. Um, but truly, I see that the more trust I feel in the universe, the the eat <laughs> of it all, the easier it become it becomes for me. And the more like the more I I I am inspired by life, and I'm like joyous with living instead of constantly fighting for the things that I want. And why are the like, why isn't my life the way exactly as I planned it to be? And I think India is a lot is a lot about that. I heard I've heard stories about India. I've never been there, um, but hearing to hearing you um, narrate this story, it was yeah another confirmation that it's all about that surrendering and basically <laughs> just going towards what you know is awaiting for you there. Yeah, I think it's an intense place for manifestation. Mm -hmm. Um, whether you bring your fears or um, your passions to the table, India reflects that back to you. Um, and I think the first part of my trip was absolutely me feeling the intensity of the fear and kind of the smallness in my body. 
And then the second half of the trip was this like magical carpet ride. It was ridiculous, <laughs> it, ridiculously amazing. Um, but I want to touch on what you said about trust. What comes to mind is just this permission slip for the people that are watching that you can challenge the universe to show up for you. If you need your faith exercised and reflected back to you, ask the universe to show up and deliver some magic and miracles. And, and I think it's important to keep track. Actually, that's one of the things that has been one of the most profound practices that I have is keeping a calendar of the brave actions that I take, the things that really feel like I'm stretching myself out of my comfort zone and keeping track of what magic and miracles show up because I really see a direct relationship between the bold action that I take and the way that the universe serves up synchronicity and just some really cool shit for me. <laughs> I, re I had a wall calendar in my apartment last year and I ran out of room I was writing down all of this, the you know amazing things that felt to me like signs, not using anybody else's metric or judgment, but what felt to me like, ooh, ah, oh, that's good. <laughs> and I, I would ran out, uh, I would run out of room, and the calendar was bigger than the screen that's behind you. It, when you pay attention, it's coming out of the seams of the universe, and it's absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -mm. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I was thinking about something. So like you mentioned a lot, um, receiving information from your guides. And this is something that I do not know how to explain to people. Like maybe you are better at, <laughs> you're doing a better job at explaining it. Because um, mostly when, when people are starting to trust or to try to trust their intuition. Um, they want to know how exactly they can recognize the messages that they are getting and how they can recognize the guides. So how are you doing it with your clients? Um, and is it that you are channeling? Are you like a, a voice for their guides or are you just allowing, holding the space for them to directly interact with their guides? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as far as the work that I do, it's a combination of factors. I always set my intention as I begin um, a new program or a new offering to activate the soul contracts of the people that need to work with me. Whoever is ready to show up right now, that's the people that I call in, um, which winds up being pretty magical. Uh, I do hear messages for other people. And when I say hear, I'm using the word loosely. Usually what happens is, depending on the potency of the message, which is actually a direct reflection of what my strength is at the time, if I'm feeling really healthy and well-rested, it's almost as if a church bell is going off in my head and the words are in all capital letters. And it's <laughs> very, very potent. It's very high vibration is a phrase that people in the woo realm would use. <laughs> and if I'm not feeling as strong in my body, maybe I don't have as much sleep or I'm not as well fed, the messages may come through as images mm. um, or concepts. It's a, it's a really common thing for me to get metaphors. Sometimes I will channel messages for people that show up and say that they want one on my Facebook page. And I feel like I'm pulling out um, like Chinese fortune cookie. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna break this and I'm gonna tell you the meaning of it. <laughs> like, come on, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but I also help people understand where the messages are showing up in their lives. And it's really important for me to hold space, to allow for the possibility that it can look completely different from anything that anybody else is getting, including maybe something that I've never seen. And I've been doing this for a while. So there are some some less typical signals that show up. But um, what's important for me is that everyone is sovereign in their own life, that they're in charge. They're, they are the judge of whether or not there is a sign, whether or not it feels meaningful. And that's what I would say for anyone who's listening that wants to try it on their own is you can't fill a cup that's full. And most people that I interact with, you know, busy as the new black, people are obsessed with emotion. And if you want to draw in messages from the divine, you have to make space. There has to be room for it. So whether it's 60 seconds in the beginning of the day when you're still in bed and you ask for guidance or 
you go out at lunchtime and you put yourself by a tree and you just breathe a little bit of unstructured time, a little bit of stillness, and then allowing yourself to see what shows up. And the other thing I would say is absolutely essential is to get comfortable with being in your body. And I mentioned this, this idea of like time traveling, being in the future or being in the past, but not being in the present moment all of our power, all of our considerable strength is in the present moment and it's grounded in the house of our body. Mm. When we access our intuition, it's a felt sense typically. Most of the clients that I'm interacting with aren't seeing images, they're not like seeing ghosts or anything like that. And they're usually not hearing anything either. They're getting impressions of things or they're getting little nudges in their body, like, do that, that feels good. Let's, let's try more of that. And so I think it's really exciting because to me, that's like much more accessible. If I was talking about seeing entities in my bedroom, you would be like, <laughs> one, maybe she's a Fruit Loop, and two, I can't do that. But it, it's so simple, it's so easy to practice this. You just need, even like 30 seconds of stillness, you could literally go into the toilet and sit down <laughs> and just pay attention to what is showing up when you ask yourself a question. And I, I really do think it's that powerful and it's that simple, just allowing yourself to honor what information you receive. Because the other thing that happens, I mentioned that I was in this toxic relationship that I was trying to leave. Mm -hmm. What happens is, so many people that I encounter will be in a position in their lives where they have a job that they don't like or like a really fractious relationship with their family or some other thing that's going on in their world that feels like this volcano that they can't manage. And that dampens your intuition when you're in a space where you are not honoring that you're being guided away from something or someone it's really difficult to put yourself in a position where you can ask questions and get intuitive information because basically your guides are telling you, you need to handle this thing first. Seriously, it, it's having a huge weight on you. It's really dense. Deal with this first. And a lot of times what people want to do is they want to do like a little detour around that. And you can't, you can't, you have to address the volcano that's like erupting in front of you first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know I've been there and I think that many of the people that I've been working with and collaborating with also try to kind of do that like okay I'm gonna come back later and do this I'm now just gonna go on a trip to Honolulu <laughs> yeah that'll be and then it's gonna <laughs> yeah and then it's gonna it's just gonna appear there you get on a thing like for me it was very interesting to understand that I moved from France to Germany to Thailand and to Portugal but I could not escape myself so <laughs> at one point I had to okay do that let's have a chat <laughs> yeah, that's what it was made. I hear you. yeah yeah um and it's also something interesting that i would like to share uh because i i was thinking about the messages and how for me i also did some spiritual uh work with people who were channeling or like speaking to angels and um i consider myself a spiritual person but it was very difficult for me to grasp this so like uh, when when they were telling me oh this archangel is here and they are saying this and that um and then i told myself okay maybe this is not where i i am playing at right now i can't really like give in to this um but i would ask god for little signs and then on the on the t-shirts of people i would meet on the street there were these messages <laughs> so like you are good enough or <laughs> you've totally got this and i was like laughing my heart out because i was thinking okay god has a really really cute sense of humor <laughs> yeah that's that's yeah. perfect that's totally the space that i play in um i don't consider myself overly serious and a lot of the people that I interact with in this very spiritual space take themselves very seriously. And as far as I'm concerned, my F-bombs are welcome. God doesn't mind. Um, we're like, we're deep in the mix of real stuff and there needs to be space for 
the the nonsense and the pain and the f bombs. Like you, it, we need to be playful. I, I call it the go lightly method. It's really important that you don't take it too seriously. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a, another lesson that was difficult for me to integrate because um, it mostly, I guess, many of us, when we start growing up and we understand that uh, <laughs> I know we, we came with a kit of successful living <laughs> um, and then we totally like we are very, very um, clinched to this expectation of our life becoming in a certain way. And when we see that we are going further and further from that ideal life, then everything becomes so serious and we are clinching to that partner because we have to have kids before we turn 30 and all this like hell on earth unleashes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. there with you, sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which brings me to my, to my next question. Um, how does success look like for you in business and in life? Oh, it's all about spaciousness and pleasure. That's what I want for my clients. That Those are the people that become my clients. And that's what I want for myself. The flexibility to build my business in a way that reflects my deepest creative expression, passion of my soul, um, and the ability to be flexible. I just took 90 days to go to India on spiritual walkabout because the voices in my head told me to. That to me is success. It really is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> it's very interesting. Like I, I really like this question about success. It looks so different from from person to person. Exactly, exactly. It can look different for everybody. Yeah. Um. So at this moment in your life and in your business, what do you find most rewarding? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat it, my dear? Yeah. Um. <laughs> maybe the universe is calling. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey <laughs> hey Steph this is the universe talking <laughs> this is the universe calling <laughs> um I was asking you about what you find most rewarding in your work and in your life mm. actually the universe is calling because my battery is getting ready to run out <laughs> <laughs> I just got and I like sneaked out of the screen <laughs> do you need to plug it in I do <laughs> I do <laughs> Give me two seconds. Yes. Just stand by. Stand by. No I can make another joke about the universe. <laughs> yeah, do it. Do it. No, but I wanted to share something with you, with those of you watching here. Um, so this, this thing about what you find the most rewarding, it was a very interesting uh, point in my life. And what Steph was also mentioning just before waking up in the morning and finding something that I want to create and kind of like reward myself and reward the universe with. Um, and it's another thing that I, that I do in the morning. So like I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm alive, yay! Um, and then I ask for um, for support. So I'm like, okay, God, universe, please use me and use my powers to do your thing. <laughs> yeah. So I just shared this little thing about uh, what I found most, like my most rewarding moments are my uh, moments upon waking up and like gratitude, and I'm like celebrating being alive. <laughs> um, and then yeah, basically asking. Okay. Sorry, I'm. Here. I was he I was hearing you very low, like the volume was very low. I just I think that gratitude is so incredibly powerful and I love that you have that practice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it took me, it took me only 30 years to get here. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long it took. <laughs> no, but I'm very, very grateful for for getting in touch with this. And I was also saying that I wake up and I make this my practice to say, okay, God, so I'm showing up, do your thing, like work through me, work the magic through me and help me love. Because basically this is the thing that I, I think I was brought in this love to do too. Basically love <laughs> myself and people. Oh, the idea of what's coming through you is so powerful because... I think it's a combination, you know, I think I, I truly do. I believe in animal totems and angels and ascended masters, but I also think it's our highest self, you know, mm -hmm. our soul, that infinite part of us is also providing us guidance, like, okay, a little bit to the left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, now a little to the right. <laughs> like, like the first time you parallel park a car, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess, but you get better. And you learn over time what the signals are 
know, I really do think that our high self is guiding us all the time. Mm. And so when we understand what those signals are, it's so powerful. And that's a part of what I do is I help people get that decoder ring and anybody can do it. And I love that we're in a time of ease where you can just ask, you can just ask for help. And the universe says, yeah, we got you. Hey, Rita. <laughs> Rita is saying hi. <laughs> um, yep. So I was asking you about your most rewarding thingy in your life and in your business. Oh, wow. That's a big question. <laughs> Just a rewarding thing then, not the most rewarding <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's so much. I think just being able to show up every day and truly feel like not only am I doing great work, but it feels really good on the inside of me. Um, mm. It feels playful, um, vibrant, juicy, fun. All of these things is so rewarding. I've I've had one of those careers, one of those professional experiences. I I started working when I was really young. My, family was poor. I've always been good at working. I can work harder, but I can also work smarter. And I would be promoted to management positions in any company that I joined. But being good, quote, being good at this job is the best thing that I could ask for because it just feels so juicy to show up. Even if I sucked at it, I think it would feel good because it's just it's so much fun and it's so helpful. I mm. love it. Yeah. And there is such a need for this because as you were saying, more and more people are finding are are finding in this capital sense of who am I and what am I here for? And yeah. I like this. I like that more and more people are inquiring um, and are becoming also more and more interested in spirituality, like in the broad sense of spirituality. Yeah, it's really come into like mainstream conversation. Whereas I feel like when I was growing up, people that talked about these sorts of things were looked at a little strangely, like, okay, whatever. And now it's, you know, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, do whatever you want. And yeah. this will to generate more goodwill and fun in the world. So I'm all about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, great. So Steph, Okay, I have one more question. <laughs> I'm really curious. We were we were talking about vulnerability and um, you were mentioning how being vulnerable actually helps other people show up um, as real as they are in that in that very moment. Um, and I was mentioning Brittany Brown, right? So Brittany Brown, she's she's working. Uh, she's oh my god, this, I love I love her work around vulnerability and shame. Um, what other inspirations do you have? Whom else do you find inspiring? You know, I I could name you some big names, um, but I really think that here I just need to shout out to normal people. You know, mm -hmm. I need to shout out to like the every man and every woman that are showing up in their lives every day and doing hard things because they believe in it. Um, on my Facebook page, I share stories and I invite people to tell me in response to stories of like intense physical vitality and courage about the things that they can't do. Like there's this woman who is a nun, she's in her seventies or her eighties, and she is an Ironman triathlete. I don't know if you're familiar with Ironman. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she's one of the most fit elderly women probably on the planet. And I just think that there was such heroism and such badassery in everyday people showing up for their lives. When I was in my old profession, I think one of the things that I avoided was this idea that tomorrow isn't guaranteed. If you mm. have a car accident, you might not be here. The, the idea of retiring and then enjoying the fun in your life is something that basically is a story. You know, it's a social construct. It's a narrative. It's not a guarantee. And I just think that there is such wild courage in normal people saying i'm not going to take the status quo because that's what i should be doing i'm going to follow this particular path because that's what feels right and that's what feels like boldness for me because no matter what it looks like to anybody else your soul's path is really <laughs> terrifying <laughs> it, it can look easy on the outside um 
because you don't know what's going on in people's inside. But when you first put your work out into the world, that's a reflection of your soul's wants, your soul's expression. It's like taking your heart outside of your chest and putting it on a table near an unfriendly cat. You don't know what the cat's going to do. The cat's probably going to take its claws and bat on it. And well, you feel like you have to. So uh, hopefully you have some good antibiotics and band-aids. <laughs> a very cool metaphor. Uh, yeah. And, and you don't realize it. And then you do it and you're like, oh my God. And it's every day. Um, you know, so I could tell you I love Oprah. And I could tell you I love Martha Beck and all these other people that are building these incredible lives, Carrie Ann Moss from Annapurna Living, Danielle Laporte, all these fantastic people, Elizabeth Gilbert, and I love them. And they're such incredible, juicy bravery and courage in normal people that I've never even heard about just showing up because they're not going to settle. And mm -hmm. I love that. I, I love it. <laughs> 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 yeah, thank you very much for sure for sharing that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I am very, very grateful for the fact that we are living in these times when basically we can see more of that, more of the human being, like the what we call the normal human being, because Daniel Laporte, she, she's also a woman, you know, what I'm saying? like she's not a super woman, but she, her showing up and Elizabeth Gilbert and everybody else whom uh, that you mentioned. Um, they're showing up is kind of like normalizing the fact that e each and every us is a singularity and in our unicity we count and we matter and we are like so important and so significant and I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's never been a better time. I so acknowledge that there is suffering in the world and there's density and mm. you know it can be in my life and other people's and it can be so challenging and I just feel like we are on a threshold and there's never been a better time to come into this work, to come into like a really vibrant understanding of the blueprint of your life, which looks like following your feel good and making your dreams come alive. Mm, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So I love that one. So following your feel good, right? Yes. <laughs> Great. All the way. Follow that GPS. It will not be <laughs> Yeah, so we are going to leave you with that, guys. Um, where else can we find you? So on your website, mythicalenterprises.com. So yeah. everybody watching, you can see the, the link here. Yes. On the screen right now. <laughs> the magic <laughs> of the webs. <laughs> yes. I'm on Facebook and I play on Instagram, which I love. Uh, I'm actually, I'm hosting a class that's coming up, teaching people how to connect with their non-physical team with their allies. So if folks are interested in my energy and what I do, they can sign up on my newsletter list and get some free bites and tastes of the type of work that I do as a part of the marketing campaign to launch that class. Okay, great. So uh, we can find that on mythicalenterprises.com, right? By signing up to your newsletter. Yep. Great. Okay, cool. Um, thank you very much, Steph. It was really, really lovely. Like I kept you more, <laughs> much more than 30 minutes, 45 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad we got to connect. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. So everybody watching, you are going to find the links um, to Steph's website and Instagram and Facebook in the description of the, um, of the video. Thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Have a happy day.